All right, we're uh, we're live. So, thanks everyone uh, for joining to this fourth uh, G GDPR webinar. Um, today, we want to talk about the technical mechanism that the IAB Europe GDPR implementation group has been um, working on, which aims at helping meet uh, some of the challenges of transparency and consent under the GDPR. Um, a couple of housekeeping items first. There will be time for Q&A. Um, however, you will need to write your questions down in the top right of the WebEx event center window. You will have a little Q&A button and uh, there is a chat functionality in there where you can leave your questions and I will be reading those out um, to our panelists later. This event is recorded so you will be able to review it after the fact. The slides that will be presented are going to be shared after as well so no need to worry about that either. And um, with that to the substance, so after last week's webinar, which was on the legal and policy considerations um, regarding consent under the GDPR, um, we're very happy today to present the industry consent standard that we have been working on. And again, it aims to help publishers, advertisers, technology companies with meeting transparency and consent challenges under the GDPR. And we've been extremely lucky um, that member companies have been extremely active and contributed resources uh, toward this effort, tr tremendous uh, resources uh, to toward this effort, both on the legal interpretation of things as well as developing, finding and developing um, a technical solution to these challenges. And I want to stress that it is really an industry standard. It is not led or owned by any one company, but having said that, I also um, should say that Quantcast have been a key leader in this effort. And I'm very pleased, therefore, to be joined by Gita Harris-Newton, Chief Privacy Officer and Deputy General Counsel at Quantcast, and Summer Simpson, who is a product lead at Quantcast, who will be talking um, both about the context and uh, what the technical standard looks like. Thank you, Matthias. So without further so ado, over to you. Thanks, Matthias. So this is Gita. Um, I will just speak briefly for a few slides and then I'll turn it over to Summer who will get into some of the technical details. Let's see if I can get my slides to advance. There we go. So as Matthias mentioned, the IV Europe has a GDPR implementation working group and, and this working group has been working on consent and a consent solution for the last year. The group is comprised of a combination of trade organizations, national IABs, publishers, ad tech, et cetera. Um, and the group has been working on a legal interpretation, which as Matthias mentioned, um, there was a webinar last week, which I think is still available on the IAB Europe web website, but we also quickly realized that it was not just the legal and policy interpretations that we needed, but we actually needed a technical solution. One of the pieces that the um, group had considered is, is consent required. So under GDPR, consent is only one of six legal grounds for processing personal data, and therefore it's not always needed. Um, we understand that publishers and vendors will interpret the GDPR and related laws like e-privacy in their own ways. And the technical solution that we've developed is not meant to uh, determine whether or not consent is required, it's actually designed to be flexible and accommodate different publishers' needs centering on transparency, choice, and control. So we know that consent under GDPR and e-privacy is really a higher standard than it's been in the past, um, beginning next May, and consent will require strong cooperation between publishers and their partners. Publishers have to, you know, publishers who have a first party relationship with a consumer will have to disclose information about their partner's processing activities where consent is sought um, in order to obtain that consent from the consumer. And third parties are gonna have to provide publishers with up to date information in order that publishers can make those disclosures. Um, where consent is asked, it's important that 
information not be collected until that consent has been obtained. And then once consent is obtained, publishers need a, where to, a way to, con to share that consent status with those third party vendors. So with that, I'll turn it over to Summer to talk about the goals and start to go through the um, technical implementation of this industry standard. Thanks, Gita. Um, so as, as we were kind of uh, discussing over the, the past few months, um, there's a, a number of really high level goals that we wanted to constantly keep in mind when we were developing out um, a solution or standard. Um, first and foremost is transparency for consumers. Um, that's really what the, the law is really all about. Um, and giving them the visibility into what entities are processing their personal data and for what purposes. Um, transparency for publishers, also important, um, as they are on the front lines of this thing, um, into, you know, uh, the partners that uh, help monetize their sites and, and who's tracking uh, people on their, on their websites. Um, control for consumers is also important um, over how the personal data is used and being able to access it um, uh, and have it uh, deleted if they so choose. Uh, control for publishers also important um, since they have the relationship with the uh, with the, the, the customers um, over which partners uh, may operate on their sites uh, and their apps as well um, to process uh, personal data for for users and also for what purposes and where consent is required uh, you know obviously we needed to provide a mechanism to obtain uh, that consent and communicate the consent signal um, in situations where uh, the various players in the ecosystem would uh, have to rely on consent as their legal basis um, and where it's necessary to, to access that. Um, which led us obviously to <laughs> knowing that we had to have some sort of standardization that allowed everyone in the ecosystem uh, to communicate to each other uh, in, in regards to consent uh, and continue to operate uh, efficiently with as little disruption to the way that things work now. Um, just because the, you know, the, the way that things operate now are um, uh, difficult at times um, uh, as it is. So, you know, minimum disruption was, was really, really important um, uh, considering how many parties are in, involved in the ecosystem. So what we ended up coming up with uh, was not so much a technical solution. Uh, it was, it's, it's a common standard. A uh, number of reasons for this. Um, without a common standard, uh, you know, the fragmentation um, with everyone coming up potentially with their own solutions uh, leads to inefficiencies um, and miscommunication and not being able to really uh, work together and make sure that um, consent is, is, is passed around accordingly and, and really reliably known. And to be effective and efficient, um, the common standard had to be uh, maintained by a, a neutral entity um, with all the players uh, in, in the ecosystem agreeing to that and understanding what it meant and, um, and, and working together. Um, so we'd also developed some simple policies um, around this to ensure uh, mutual trust uh, and reassurance um, and addressing this as an industry uh, versus a, as a collection of a bunch of individual players. So uh, the three key points uh, for the standard, um, it's industry-wide um, so that uh, everyone involved in the ecosystem works together uh, to solve the consent requirements for the GDPR um, and the current EPD, um, but also keeping in mind uh, EPR is, is coming along as well um, and thinking uh, for the future. Um, we wanted it to be an open source solution that's not owned by any particular company. Um, so that uh, we all continue to contribute to it, um, <clears throat> put uh, all of our efforts together and continue to iterate and develop it uh, uh, as an industry so that we end up with, uh, with the best solution for everyone. Um, and thirdly, it's a, it's a publisher-centric tool. Um, so, you know, obviously giving consumers the, the best experience possible because we, we, as an industry, want consumers to consent. Um, so we need to put them first, <clears throat> but also ensuring that publishers make control of their sites uh, and continue to generate revenue. Um, so what is this thing? Um, it's, it's talked about with a, with a ton of different names. Uh, that's why this thing's in quotes. Uh, so it's uh, distributed registry chain. Um, it's um, not all that uh, uh, demonstrative of what it actually is, but um, basically it's 
it enables the capturing um, and the storing of, of uh, consumer consent and then communicating that consent between all the entities involved. So the publishers, the vendors, ad systems, uh, ad exchanges, all the way up the chain. So publishers uh, need to obtain consent for themselves um, and then also on behalf of the partners via um, a standard-based consent management provider. Um, this is a, a, a new acronym to learn, uh, so you'll hear me say CMP, uh, and that, that refers to the consent management provider, um, which is a part of this whole new ecosystem. So the UI sits on a publisher's page, um, and this is something that will be um, created and, and, and provided by a CMP. Um, and it provides transparency, transparency into what's happening uh, on and off the page um, with all of the various vendors that are involved there. Consent's collected uh, before cookies are written, um, so nothing gets fired until the consumer uh, gives their consent or does not. Um, and the, then the consent choices are transmitted to the vendors based on the purpose granted. Um, this is, again, it's open source, it's industry supported, uh, we wanted to have a limited impact on the existing ecosystem. Uh, there's transparency of choice for consumers as dictated by the GDPR for our interpretations um, to easily see the, the partners and purposes. So it's important for consumers to be able to see not only who is, uh, who is tracking them and collecting personal data, but for what purposes they're gonna be using it for uh, and to make it easy for consumers to manage their consent preferences. Uh, the other piece of it that's really, really important just for checks and balances is having an audit trail um, that uh, vendors, CMPs, publishers, everyone's able to access to be able to prove uh, consent status um, and that it's also desktop and mobile supported. So this is a, just a very quick high level, uh, possibly slightly less confusing view of what the actual ecosystem looks like. Um, to give you kind of an idea of, of, of what we're talking about. So in the orange box, this is, this is the, the, what's representative of the, of the central entity um, and uh, what will be uh, part of the standard and how things are communicated. Um, so, the, and I'll, I'll go into this in just a second, uh, but there are certain elements of, of the solution that are maintained by a central entity and then there are these consent management providers um, that are uh, enabled and managed by that central entity um, that then are the kind of the gateway um, for collecting consent, passing that information around and making it available for SSPs, DSPs, uh, and uh, everyone up the, up the chain exchanges um, to understand the consent signal, know if they have consent in order to be able to uh, place their, their cookies, fire their pixels, do their analytics tracking, uh, and, uh, and uh, respond to uh, bid requests and display ad campaigns and track them. So these are the pieces um, of the, the high level pieces of the technology. So um, there will be this industry wide um, list of vendors um, that's maintained by the central entity. Um, the vendors have to uh, adhere to a set of uh, protocols and policies that are determined by the group. Um, publishers will have choice. Uh, the, the solution supports publisher choice in, what, in, in controlling what vendors um, uh, have access and can set cookies and fire pixels and things um, from their site um, and which ones are displayed to consumers. Um, but we do maintain this, uh, this global um, set of vendors um, that, uh, that publishers can uh, fall back on um, to provide global consent. Um, there's a standardized mechanism. This is a, a, a JavaScript-based uh, API um, <clears throat> that will be used um, so that uh, basically everyone can, it will be speaking the same language uh, and be able to very quickly and easily um, check to see if they have consent, understand what that uh, consent means, um, uh, understand as a vendor, do I have consent? Yes, if so, for what purposes? Um, and it's all used for requesting, storing, um, and sharing the consent uh, throughout the ecosystem. Um, again, it's an open source specification. Uh, we'll have uh, reference materials uh, that people can, uh, can look at um, with examples um, to show you know, how to interact with, uh, with the uh, with, the, with the API. 
Um, and then consent management providers uh, will be offering end-to-end uh, -end solutions. And one of the interesting things I think um, that I really like about the solution is that it's distributed. So that means that, uh, you know, any company who uh, agrees to, you know, work within certain uh, uh, policies can be a consent uh, management provider, which gives publishers choices in who they work with. Um, and uh, it's, it's just, it's, I think it's, it's a lot better for the ecosystem because then consent management providers can determine, you know, what kinds of uh, functionality they want to provide, how much customization they want to provide, and work directly with publishers to give them the best experience. Next slide. I, sorry, I advanced it. It might be taking a minute to update. Okay. I see implementation targets on my screen. If nobody else does, I can I can speak to it. Uh, yeah, actually, I have it. I have a, a backup on my screen. So, um, as far as timeline goes, um, we are planning on public uh, publicly making available the technical specifications uh, in early January. Um, so everybody will have be able to, to check it out, um, see all what's involved. Um, we're in the process right now of doing final reviews on it. Um, we've developed out some proof of concepts uh, to test it just to make sure that we've got all the corner cases and such covered. Um, and then uh, we will um, uh, have the policy standard uh, version one uh, available for testing in February uh, and begin to do some, uh, some early integrations. Uh, part of this, um, part of the solution, um, which is there's a dependency on open RTB, um, that's required to pass the consent signal from SSPs to ad exchanges and, and up the chain. Um, that will be uh, available in um, February as well. Um, and then uh, we'll have reference, reference implementations available for people to check out. This is like integrations with, uh, that CMPs have with, with sites uh, in February as well. So we're aiming for, for early to mid Q1 um, to get something up and out there for people to see that it's that it's working um, and to begin um, their own uh, integrations. So we'll be hopefully well ahead of the May schedule. Uh, and then finally, the last slide, uh, if, oh, there you go, you can see it. Um, all the folks who have, uh, have been working on the solution together for the many past months uh, and are now endorsing um, the industry standard. Um, and some of which will be offering uh, their own content management provider solutions as well um, uh, are listed here. If I can jump in there and say that uh, mm -hmm. those, are, those are the endorsers and the group that's been working on that is actually even more encompassing than those logos you see on there. It's just that some of them haven't come out to publicly endorse it yet, but this list is growing. And then if you can see this next slide, which is um, letting you know how to get more information and stay informed. So the IV Europe has set up this website, advertisingconsent.eu, um, with the URL here. If you uh, navigate to that page, you have the ability to sign up to get on the mailing list so that uh, whenever any more information is released or as those specifications and documents that Summer talked about uh, are made available, you'll get notification from IB Europe. And then we have some additional uh, technical slides that we can go into some more technical detail. I think we have the time. If Summer, you want to speak to those? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, so this is a kind of a detailed example of, uh, of what the vendor list might look like. Um, the vendor list will be used for a number of purposes. Um, one, obviously, is to serve as a map um, for, uh, for the consent. So consent right now will be stored in um, just a couple of options. So there's the, the global uh, consent option, 
which is kind of like a, an out of the box version of the solution. Um, and uh, each it, within the cookie, um, it's basically a string of ones and zeros. So zero meaning the consumer is not given consent, one being they have given consent. Um, and each position in that chain of ones and zeros will be assigned to a vendor in the list. So that way a vendor knows their ID. When they come, they query the API, um, they get back a one or zero, they know if they have consent and can um, do what they need to do. Um, it will also be used um, for presenting the, the consumer facing UX. So um, uh, obviously we have to present uh, uh, to users at, at various levels. They need to be able to see uh, what purposes um, they're being tracked for and be able to give consent on a purpose level basis. And within those purposes, be able to see the list of vendors that apply to that purpose. Um, and then also, uh, you can even take it down to the, the vendor level um, and see a complete list of all the vendors that um, are looking to track the consumer and allow the consumer to um, set their permissions uh, for consent based on that as well. Um, so publisher CMPs will use this vendor list um, as a way to disclose that information in the UI to the consumer. And should we go to the next one? Um, so this gets into a little bit more detail about the, um, the API, the JavaScript API. Um, uh, so it, um, Basically, there's going to be a number of functions um, that are uh, are standard that everybody will know. If I come, if I'm on this page, I can hit this. I can call this function, um, and it will say, "Get my get my consent, uh, or get a vendor list, or get um, a, a number of anything they would need to actually operate in the ecosystem." Um, and that's the the specification that we'll be releasing uh, relatively soon. Um, so this is the piece that all the, the CMPs um, will um, integrate with to produce their um, solution that publishers uh, and actually any site uh, will uh, embed on their website. We, um, at, at Quantcast, um, we're in the process right now of, of doing a little bit of testing around the, the UX. Um, and trying to figure out um, what are the, the best ways to, to present it that are going to um, be the most clear to consumers, uh, give uh, publishers the, the amount of customization that they need, uh, and also to um, basically achieve the best uh, uh, consent, positive consent signal um, uh, response as possible from consumers. We'll be sharing that with, uh, with, with folks as well. Go to the next slide, Vita. I did. Hopefully, you can there see it now. Okay. Yeah, it's there now. I um, might be a little bit slow. Um, so the the storage of the consent. I talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, so um, it requires uh, two mechanisms: a user identification method and a persistence method. With the ID, um, it needs to be uh, the identification for uh, is needed for global consent. Uh, to be uh, made um, uh, basically a way for, for uh, people to um, uh, understand that the consumer is, has, has given consent and that's stored in a third party cookie on their site. There's also um, a first party cookie option as well because we know that publishers and other websites will need to get um, uh, consent for themselves. Um, and it's also a way for, for publishers to um, uh, store their own uh, custom versions of, of uh, the vendor consent that they're, they're looking to get uh, consent for. Um, we are looking into, because we know that uh, third-party cookies are probably not the best option for, for many reasons. Um, this is what we're going out with initially uh, so we can get to market quickly and then begin collecting consent. Um, the team's going to get back together um, early in January and begin looking at other options um, that have uh, uh, better persistence um, than a, than a third-party cookie. So I talked about this already. Um, 
uh, the way that uh, the consent's stored um, and uh, and how it's transmitted. Um, it's very simple, um, just you know, a one or zero, um, and the CMPs will be able and vendors to participate um, will be able to very quickly and easily understand whether they have consent or not, and then um, uh, do what they need to do. Um, you know whether they're uh, dropping their cookies or firing pixels for um, for tracking purposes. Um, this might be getting a little bit too detailed. Um, again, this this is kind of shows you a visual visualization of how um, uh, of, of essentially the vendor map um, and how the cookie um, will be structured, um, <clears throat> so that we can not only track at the consent for vendor level, but also the consent for purpose level, um, and how uh, the cookie will be uh, read, and people can um, vendors can get the information out of it they need to understand. I have consent for you know, purpose X, but maybe not for purpose Y in the case where vendors have um, uh, multiple purposes as they operate under. Um, so this, uh, <laughs> this is, this would be the very complex version of the uh, original diagram that was shown earlier. Um, and uh, the, really the, the, the big point here is showing how things, um, how things operate um, when some vendors have consent and others do not have consent. So in this case, all the green, um, the consent signal is positive for them. Uh, therefore, they can uh, fire their cookies or pass, get the consumer information to pass along up the chain via open RTB um, uh, to the ad exchanges and other DSPs. Um, in red are the ones that do not have consent. So you can see it stops with them. Um, and that user information is is not passed along, um, and they can no longer take uh, any action beyond uh, checking to see checking the consent signal. So all of this uh, basically um, enables us to uh, really provide um, good transparency. Uh, into the supply chain for consumers and publishers, um, where once, you know, couldn't really see um, who was firing what, who was taking your personal information and, and, and passing it along and, um, and, uh, and, and tracking you. Uh, now consumers have a very uh, clear understanding of just which vendors um, are tracking them and for what purposes, uh, and, and publishers do as well. Um, also gives publishers a bit more control um, over um, the uh, the companies that are uh, dropping those cookies and, and tracking users to their site. Um, the uh, audit trail is also an interesting aspect of this. Um, and uh, the standard itself, um, while it doesn't necessarily um, set a method uh, for uh, creating an audit trail. Um, we're working or talking amongst ourselves of, um, and working together to, you know, generate some best practices around this um, uh, for vendors to be able to basically log when, um, when a user is given consent. Um, so they, they, they keep an audit trail of when they've been given consent via what CMP, based on the CMP's ID, um, and on what date. So that um, if any issue occurs, we always have something to go back to to say, okay, yes, you know, I had consent on this date, or no, I did not have consent on this date, and therefore should not have um, done my tracking. And all of this, you know, without uh, disruption, really, to the existing uh, supply chain um, that uh, that publishers depend on for ad, ad revenue. And so with that, I think we're, again, just back to um, reminding you of the advertisingconsent.eu website of IV Europe so that you can go to to sign up for more information um, to receive, to get on their mailing list and hear from them um, as more information becomes available. And I think that we're ready to open it up for questions, Matthias. Thanks so much, guys. Um, I can't see any questions just yet, so... Um, Reminder, everyone, if you have questions, there is a chat and a Q&A um, uh, 
box up there where you can ask your questions, and perhaps I'll just start off with the first one, and hopefully we'll have collected a few questions then. Um, could you could you go into what a CMP is a little more, and who can be a CMP? Will it be a new vendor that will enter the ecosystem, a new part of the Lumascape, or, or, or you know, how how to imagine um, how that that pans out? And also related to that. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you expect the cost to be for publishers, advertisers, or technology companies that want to participate in this mechanism? Excellent question. <laughs> um, this is a, something I, I kind of breezed over a little bit in the in the in the um, overview. So um, the, the consent management providers, the CMPs, um, one of the one of the responsibilities of the central entity um, will be maintaining a central DNS server, um, and uh, anyone who wants to be a CMP, which again can be anyone, um, it could be you know uh, AppNexus, it could be um, Digitrust, it could be Quantcast, it could be a publisher. Um, in order for them to in order for this whole structure to work and for people to be able to read uh, uh, the consent signal from, from the cookies, they need to operate from within a subdomain. So this, uh, if a company wants to be a CMP, um, they need to agree to certain policies and procedures and such um, for participating in the ecosystem. Um, then the central entity will delegate uh, a subdomain to them. So for instance, um, you know, it might be like, cmp1.consent.eu. Uh, um, and then that way, all of the CMPs will be able to read and write uh, cookies um, that store the, the consent uh, within this ecosystem. Um, the CMPs will then, you know, uh, create their own uh, consent UX. They'll um, develop against the standard JavaScript API. Um, and then make that available to websites that want to install the, the consent solution. Um, because this is a, an open source um, uh, product, so to speak, um, or standard, um, it's going to be up to the CMPs, um, you know, if they decide to, to charge or not. Uh, the direction that we're going in um, is that if people do charge, um, it would be uh, just at, at cost uh, for folks, um, what we want to do is make sure that, um, you know, we get as, as much participation with the industry solution um, from, from everyone so that it, it works and we have minimal disruption to the way we operate um, uh, compared to now. Um, I can't speak for, for other companies. Uh, the, the, CMP that we're in the process of developing or the, the consent solution that Quantcast is developing right now um, and we'll be testing over the next few weeks uh, and ready for January, um, we'll, we'll actually be offering uh, for free to our, uh, our partners um, and making that available. Cool, thanks. So we have a bunch of questions. I'll start getting through them. We have one from Claudius G who's asking um, whether uh, there is a publisher dimension to, to this as well. So we've talked about global consent, but what about um, uh, publishers choosing to have consents um, that, are, that are specific to, to their site or their service? Is that supported by this? Yes, absolutely. That's part of the, um, that's, that's something that the publishers will work with the CMP that they choose um, to develop out, but the, the standard itself um, definitely supports that flexibility. And what about uh, bundling purposes? Will the will the user have to um, consent to each purpose individually, or, or or can they be bundled as well? What what about what about the flexibility in that area? So I would say that um, I would jump in to say that we know we all know that the Article Twenty Nine Working Party um, opinion on consent just came out a few days ago, and obviously everyone is digesting that. So. Um, the, the policy component of the IB Europe's working group is, is looking at that and, and still sort of figuring out the best way to present 
um, the purposes to the consumer. But as you saw from the presentation earlier, the idea is that the consumer would have granularity to be able to uh, agree, give consent for some purposes and not give consent for other purposes. Cool, and uh, Kellen Bergstrand asks, how publishers uh, would be convinced to use this tool and uh, you know who who will be who who will be doing the convincing can you talk to that well i i think that public, there are some publishers that have been involved in this working group and providing um, their opinions and participating throughout um, as well, you know, a number of the companies in the working group, such as Quantcast, have been reaching out to publishers um, to get their input. Um, and there are a number of publishers now, um, you know, who we are engaging with to try and, and um, build something that the, that the publishers want. Um, because we feel like, as we talked about earlier, a standard solution will really um, benefit the publisher as well as everyone um, in, in the industry, including by, by, for consumers um, as well. And I, Summer, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that. Sure, that, I mean, that was, was part of the, the thinking and, and one of the major drivers behind the development of the standard was, um, you know, trying to come up with something that would take a lot of the responsibility um, off the publishers um, in having to, you know, not having to the, develop their own solution or figure this out on their own um, and uh, making sure that we provided something that um, the rest of the industry would participate in so that they didn't have to um, do one-offs with uh, with every single member of the ecosystem. So, I think that's that's the big driver is that it um, it, it takes care of the the heavy lifting for publishers while giving them the customizations that they need. Cool. So then uh, we have uh, more or less the same question twice, which is um, essentially we've talked about obtaining consent. Uh, what about the opposite? What about withdrawing consent? How's that? How how does that work? Um, so there's there's so there's two ways, right? So when a when we see a user for the for the first time, uh, so um, CNP pops up requests consent, the consumer can uh, opt out at that point, um, and that gets stored in their cookie, um, and follows them, you know, where they go. Um, if at any time, let's say a consumer um, has opted in um, or given their consent, if at any time they want to <clears throat> revoke that, um, there will be a, a UX that they can go to um, provided by uh, the CMPs to, to do that. And they'll be able to opt out for by individual vendor, opt out by purpose, or just opt out entirely. And just, and depending to, on, just to highlight, okay. sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say, just to highlight, it's really um, revocation that we're talking about. So, um, you know, once they give consent, the, the expectation is to make revocation of consent very simple and easy for the consumer to accomplish. What happens if a user does not give consent or they withdraw their consent? Um, then when they go to websites, uh, the vendors won't have uh, the, uh, the consent to, to track them. And at that point, I mean, that's kind of where the standard ends, right? At that point, it's up to the publishers um, to determine uh, what they what they do with that. Cool. Um, so obviously, there are certain policies you mentioned uh, around uh, CMPs. In order to become a CMP, you need to agree to, uh, to 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 follow certain rules. Who sets up these rules? So the expectation, as you saw in the presentation, is that there's a central entity that um, has a rather light touch to, to manage this um, standard. So that central entity, whether it's Ivy Europe or some other entity, um, would be the one that um, maintains the central domain so that a CMP would come to that central entity to be assigned a subdomain. Um, there would be a, a sort of basic set of um, principles of, you know, following the protocol that that CMP would need to agree to. 
um, and those will be forthcoming. So those are, are things that are um, being discussed at the, in the policy committee level and as we talked about um, in one of the prior slides, the, the sort of testing phase um, in January and February, uh, you'll be able to see um, those policy pieces as well. If I want to join this effort and endorse the standard, what do I do? Who do I contact? Yeah, you should contact Ivy Europe. And right now we have on the screen um, the advertisingconsent.eu page. So I would encourage you to go to that page um, and sign up. And I think Matthias, Matthias, is that the best way for them to do it? Uh, that's a good way to do it, and um, you may also send me an email directly, Matthiesen, M-A-T-T-H-I-E-S-E-N, at iabeurope.eu, and I will um, talk to you about that. Um, do, you, do you think that there will be some sort of vetting procedure uh, uh, involved for vendors to join to join this uh, this list, uh, or is it a free for all? Just everybody who wants to join can can, can join. And uh, what about bad actors? Yeah, so you know we'd like to be as inclusive as possible, so that vendors, you know, whatever vendors would like to use this um, protocol can use it. But we do expect that there will be a baseline set of minimum standards. So in the same way that we talked about for the CMP, there are certain protocols they need to follow and baseline principles. The same would be the case for the vendor. Um, you know, the vendor needs to keep their purposes up to date, for example, um, you know, keep, you know, provide the link for their privacy policy, et cetera. Again, these are things that are um, being worked through by the working group and, um, those baselines will be available uh, when the standard is available for testing. And I would also say that I think um, long term, I know speaking for myself personally, um, I could see us getting to a place where um, there's a more rigorous process, vetting process, even auditing potentially um, that could take place, you know, for those vendors, for example, to get on that list. But I think that for kind of this version one and what's going to be available early in 2018, there won't be a robust program in place because there's simply not time, but it's something that the working group is considering and um, maybe something to move toward uh, for future improvements. So would it be logical to introduce a setup as an industry code of conduct that is sanctioned um, by, by DPAs and, and the European Commission under the GDPR? That's one option. Um, and as I said, I think for the initial testing, it's not something that is really achievable in the time frame. But I think that um, that's certainly an option that could be on the table moving forward. Cool. Uh, then Borneman asks whether we are planning to bring this uh, uh, to 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 the market, and uh, are we are we going to have roadshows and marketing activities? Are are you going to travel Europe to talk about this? I think we're still, um, and and I'll let you speak to that too, Matthias. I think we're still, um, you know, figuring out how best to communicate this across the industry. Certainly welcome feedback from folks. Again, you can, you know, um, contact me, Summer, contact Matthias, um, but certainly we'd like to get the word out. Um, and I know we've been getting a lot of inquiries from a lot of folks and, you know, providing information as, as, as to, to folks who contact us. So, um, yeah, we definitely open to suggestion on, on how to get this out to folks. Yeah, so and I'm happy to go to Europe anytime. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that, that that's good. Um, it's the weather is not as nice around this time of the year, um, but it's 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 good to know that there's interest. And um, I I can I can say that uh, there is um, several markets who show great interest, and uh, we are keen to cooperate with the um, IAB in in those markets uh, to to uh, ensure that 
market participants have the best information about this. And you know, we're certainly contemplating doing a roadshow, and we uh, would welcome any invitation to, to come and uh, speak to publishers, technology companies, and advertisers in the European markets. Um, so you talked about this being an open source standard, and where can I go and look at the specifications? Is there a GitHub? Um, you know, how how do I go about looking at the openness of that source? So right now, the specification hasn't been released publicly, um, so you can't go look at it now uh, unless you're in the IV Europe's uh, GDPR implementation working group but that's something that I think will be forthcoming. If uh, I'm a publisher and I want to test this thing, how can I get involved for initial testing? Again, I would say let us know. Um, either, you know, Summers and my email addresses are in the beginning of this deck on the first slide. Um, you've got the link for the IV Europe's um, page up on your screen now. Let us know. I think um, we're, we're, we at QuantCast are really excited to um, work with publishers and test this out and, um, you know, make improvements to it to create a really good product. So I would say reach out. You've seen the... Um... The, the logos of the endorsers, I, um, you know, if you recognize one of your business partners, perhaps talk to them if they're interested in testing this, um, you know, um, that, that might, be, might be an option as well. Um, I mean, really, this is in the hands of companies, right? Uh, so reach out to your partners and us too, but you're going to be doing the testing. <laughs> Um, so there's a question here about examples of what things could look like, but I can already say that we don't currently have um, a good mock-up. Um, but, but will it be possible to say yes and no on a per-company basis? So can I say yes. Yes, yes to Quantcast, but not yes to another company? Yes, so the idea, um, which hopefully you, you um, took away from some of the slides, is that there would be granularity of purpose and, and choice around purpose as well as around company. So you would be able to say, for example, you know, yes to one purpose, no to another purpose, as well as, um, you know, yes to Quantcast and no to another company. So granularity is offered. Um, when a user withdraws consent, is that the same as them saying they want to exercise their right to be forgotten? Will everybody that participates in this scheme be told, delete this user? So um, that's a great question. I think that um, this scheme will communicate a signal around um, whether consent is, whether there is consent or not. And as Summer talked about on an earlier slide, uh, the ability to revoke consent is part of what will be provided in this protocol. Um, how companies then interpret that uh, around a deletion or a separate, uh, you know, exercise of a right to be forgotten um, currently isn't in the standard, but, um, you know, certainly something that is being discussed at the policy level. So if I, if I were to go to two different publishers and I um, grant my consent to Quantcast to process my data on publisher one, and then I go to publisher two, but on publisher two, I really don't want Quantcast to be processing my data. Do I have that type of granularity of choice as well? Is that something that the standard can support? Summer, do you want to take this it, one, or do you want me to take it? Yeah, sure. It, it, the, the standard definitely supports that. Um, what I would say is it, it depends on each of the two publishers in the example and how they have configured consent for through their chosen CMP um, to collect it. So let's say that, um, you know, publisher one 
um, has uh, service level or they've, they're they collecting consent, you know, for at, for at a site level for themselves. Um, and they give, the user gives consent there. When they go to the next publisher um, and say they don't give their consent, um, and that publisher is also site specific, then it, the, the system, uh, well, Quantcast has to recognize that um, based on each uh, site separately. Um, if in one it's global consent, then wherever the consumer goes, um, they, Quantcast will have permission for them uh, to track them unless they go to a site where it's site specific and then they won't have it there. But there is, there's definitely that flexibility. Um, there is that level of complexity uh, built into the, the standard. Um, and it's just, it'll be really up to uh, CMPs and publishers and how they um, uh, make that available on their, on their sites. So that leads to a really you know, logical follow-up question. What if there is a, a global consent and a service specific consent? What happens then? And you know, they might be, they might be conflicting. Maybe I say, Globally, Quantcast, yes, but then on the publisher, I say not to, no to Quantcast. So what, what is the signal that prevails in a situation like that? Uh, it's always the service level. Um, that, that, that service level cookie always overrides the global. Cool. Um, it seems that we have answered all of the questions. Is there anything you feel people should uh, take home in addition to what has already been said? I think I would just highlight again um, just a, a few key points around um, this really being um, a, a, a neutral industry mechanism um, with a lot of flexibility that, that is meant to um, provide a good customer experience, provide consumers with you know, transparency, choice, and control over their data, while also providing flexibility to publishers so that publishers also maintain control of their sites, while providing a mechanism to make it easy for the industry and the ecosystem to um, request consent from a consumer, to, and then to communicate that consent downstream. So, um, and, and with that, I think the takeaway would be, you know, um, this is a, a collaborative process with lots of companies participating, um, and, you know, we would love to hear from you. Great. Um, Gita, Summer, thanks so much for getting up early and uh, talking us through all of that. Um, for everybody who's uh, joined us, thanks for your interest. Um, you see on the screen, advertisingconsent.eu is the best place to stay informed about the developments. Um, and if you have uh, specific questions, uh, reach out to Gita, Summer, or uh, me, or any other uh, contact at the IIB Europe that you have, and we'd be keen to, um, uh, to, to answer any questions um, or to see whether we can come to your market and present this there. Uh, we definitely want to have this conversation um, continue. Thanks, everyone, and thanks, Summer Gita, especially. Thank, Thank you. you.